achievements, help overcome bias in algorithms, and ensure that the next generation of AI represents all people, society, and the planet. It's an extra special night here because we're also celebrating Museums Victoria's new video series, which is called Science is a Superpower. It has achieved more than 370,000 views since it was launched earlier this year. The series is led by Holly Ransom, who's also our host here this evening, and we're thrilled to be working with Holly, who is a globally renowned leadership expert and champion of Girls in STEM which of course is science, technology, engineering and mathematics. In each of our videos of the series, Holly speaks with museum scientists, uh, myself included, which was an amazing fun in the planetarium. And what we hope to do is to uncover the superpowers of science. And this includes things like strength, curiosity, energy, and also calmness and kindness. So I definitely invite you to check it out if you haven't seen it. But overall, it's a series that aims to inspire young women and girls into STEM fields and show that they belong. This is all part of ScienceWorks' journey. It's to prepare the next generation for the technological and the scientific challenges that they may face and ensure a thriving future for our planet. So, it is now my great pleasure to invite our host for tonight, the fabulous Holly Ransom, to introduce the guest panel. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Tanya. Round of applause. From one pink blazer to the next, that was perfectly transitioned. Uh, we, we totally did coordinate that. No, we didn't. But good evening, everyone. Uh, whether you're joining us here in the room, whether you're joining us online, welcome to this fascinating conversation. And as we get underway, I, I just want to preface, this is your conversation. I'm really excited for you to shape this and take it wherever you would like to take the three expert minds we've assembled to delve into this uh, fascinating, relevant, real-time conversation that all of you are interacting with in different ways. So, we're going to put up a Slido uh, code now that will give you the information that you need to be able to join in the conversation. So I encourage you to put that code in to visit slido.com on whatever your device of choice is. Uh, and I've got an iPad here that will be uh, getting all your questions and we'll take as many of them as we can cover. But also it'll be uh, something we can think about how we come back to and respond in, in the fullness of time for those we can't get to tonight. All right, let's get underway and allow me to introduce the fabulous uh, collection of panellists we have with me this evening. First up, uh, to my immediate left, we have Kiowa Scott Hurley, who is a digital science migration engineer at Defence Science Group. Welcome, Kiowa. Next, we have Linda McIver. Uh, Linda is the executive director at the Australian Data Science Education Institute. Welcome, Linda. And joining us from Europe, uh, which is fantastic to be able to have an international flavour to our conversation as well, we welcome Mujan Asghari, the founder of 1000 Faces and co-founder of Women in AI. Can you join me virtually and in the room giving an applause uh, to welcome our panellists? So, as you can probably gather from that brief biography I've given even of our speakers, we've got some pretty uh, different viewpoints and different expertises that are coming into the conversation, which is fantastic. Uh, so, Linda, I might come to you first. Let's start in the world of education. I know there's uh, a number of educators in the room who you've spoken to earlier today. Um, I actually Googled uh, AI in education prior to coming to the conversation today, just to check out where the commentary was at at the moment astounded me 2.1 billion search results on Google. That just speaks to how real and how live this conversation is. So, can you frame for us a little bit uh, AI in education for our audience's benefit? Where's that conversation at? What do they need to be paying attention to? So, the teachers who were in the workshop before will not be surprised by my answer. Um, but the, the big thing about AI in education is that um, it's a fabulous opportunity to teach our kids critical thinking and to teach them um, not to believe the hype. So, a lot of the hype around AI is about the things it can do um, and they, they talk about the amazing results you can get from it. What they don't tell you is that a lot of the AI systems we're interacting with, the ones we know like ChatGPT and Bing, they 
are designed to be plausible, not true and not accurate. So the results that you get will be plausible and sound terribly authoritative, but they're completely, sometimes wildly wrong. Um, I, being the narcissist that I am, I Googled myself. <laughs> well, I, I asked ChatGPT to, to write me a bio, and I asked it 10 times because I cannot get enough. It gave <laughs> me 10 different answers with um, five different places that I work, none of them mine. Um, I think there were six different uh, places where I got my PhD, none of them the place where I did get my PhD, none of the topics of my PhD were right. Um, there were bits and pieces in there that were right, and if you didn't know me really well, you could believe it, mm. but it was, it was completely wrong, it was absolutely made up. Terribly authoritative, terribly confident, terribly wrong. <laughs> and so these systems are a wonderful opportunity to give them to kids and say, ask it a question, and then critique the result. And that's a wonderful ex uh, exercise in critical thinking, and it's also a wonderful exercise in dispelling that magical thinking we have around AI. And, and the thing I want to double click on there for a moment too that you said is that's a design choice. Can you just explain <laughs> a little bit about that? Because I have a feeling we're going to keep circling back to that idea over the course of our conversation in all different ways tonight. This is all being actively designed, shaped, uh, we're going to talk about biases, no doubt. I can already see questions coming through about it. Uh, can you just explain what we mean when we say design choice? Right. So these systems, um, they, we call them large language models in the, in the computer science business, and they are um, explicitly designed to be plausible conversationalists. They are not designed, as I said, to be truthful or accurate, and that was a choice. And it's also a choice that they, that the companies have made, and Kiowa raised this in conversation earlier, it's a choice that they have made to market it mm -hmm. as something that you can use for real stuff. Um, and that I, I am horrified by that choice, but the choice is about mind share, and it's about market share, and it's about profit. It's not about social good, mm -hmm. or ethics, or truth. That feels like a perfect moment, Mujan, to bring you into the conversation. Hopefully you can hear us well from where you're joining us because you are really inter interacting with this conversation from the lens of philosophy and the lens of leadership and thinking through those complexities. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, probably referencing it to something people might have read about, which is a letter that has been co-signed by now, I think about 10,000 leaders, calling for a pause at this moment in time on the development of this particular aspect of AI we're talking about. Can you just explain to us a little bit on, when you think about these big questions around, are we being well-led at this moment? Are these design choices being well thought through? Can you just give us your view on where that's at at this moment in time? Hello, hi everyone. I'm having a little bit of difficulty to hear. Uh, there is a little bit of an echo. So do you mind to uh, repeat the last question, please, for me? Sure, I'll, I'll try and simplify the ending. Do you mind sharing your view from a philosophy, philosophy and leadership standpoint at this moment in time? How well led do you think we are in the way we're approaching the development of AI? Sure. Yes, thank you so much for um, organizing this and inviting me. So um, I would like to talk a little bit about why we are actually um, building AI. So if you look at the humans evolution, we started off by being more intelligent. Our you know, brain started to, um, to, to basically grow. We evolved into uh, more intelligent species. So the natural course of um, you know, us being a, a more uh, dominated sort of dominant um, species was to create a solution that augments us and does the thing that we don't want to do as as humans, and you know, developing technologies for us. Now, I think you know, the the way that the technology has been evolving, it is going to where it's not so shocking to see we are creating AI that at some point can be more intelligent than us and surpassing us. So from a philosophical point of view that actually makes so much sense. <laughs> but then the main question would be, what are we exactly doing 
uh, to make us more human because the essence of us being humans is to live in the world being connected to other humans, to live you know, the life that is all about expansion, about more consciousness. That's at least my point of uh, view on, you know, on why actually we're living. And, uh, and I think, you know, when you look at the technological advancements, every time there was a technology that, that it came, there was a pretty much um, huge uh, ethical issues came after it. The industrial revolution, uh, the atomic bomb, uh, and now you have, you know, um, all these advancements of AI. So there was, there's always combined with excitement mm. from, from us as humans that we are discovering something new that is actually truly exciting. That's why we have uh, turned into this species that they, uh, they have managed to um, now be uh, multi-planetary or very soon. Um, so this is, this is basically natural. So the question would be, how are we using these technologies that it makes us more human? And I believe that the AI's um, main reason should be helping us to have those experiences that is tapped in, tapping into our creativity, um, tapping into the, the parts of us that is more, more, uh, more you know, intellectual rather than, uh, let's say, doing the very boring job of um, you know, repetitive work. So I think that these are like huge questions that um, we, we might not spend so much time when we're building those technologies today as uh, companies, like huge companies of uh, tech leaders are doing, but they are fundamental to our existence. Mm. And so um, I think when you go deep into the reason of why we're um, building this, <laughs> It, we can find always, you know, the amazing usages of AI and, um, you know, the, the way that they are uh, solving big issues such as, and that is very true, uh, in healthcare, in, um, you know, in um, managing basically inventories, in finance, in so many industries, we have, we have those really useful technology advancements. But then in the fundamental way, I think there are always humans that always want to cross certain lines. <laughs> we always have that. <laughs> yeah. And so it is difficult more and more to be able to stop and put a line. So I would say the main uh, way that we can have this higher consciousness of what is going to be the main ethical line, because ethics is a very difficult topic. Ethics is very large. Ethics also changes by culture, by time, by, uh, um, by language. So how can we combine our minds, diverse talents coming together to help us to create that ethical line together that we can conserve and we can um, complete it over time? That is, I think, a very fundamental thing to the world mm. with, you know, regards to technologies such as AI that are changing everyone's life. I love it. You've uh, po posed a big question for us there. How is it making us more human? And uh, knowing there's a number of educators in the room, but more generally, even thinking about the future of the workforce, you know, when you take yourself to the World Economic Forum's list of most in-demand skills for 2030, it's interesting that seven of ten are soft skills, you know, these, these human capacities, empathy, creativity, uh, things that effectively the AI can't out us on, which is interesting as a, as a point of evolution in what we might need to be training and developing more in ourselves and certainly in, in the generations coming through. Uh, I love the questions, keep them coming. We're gonna turn to them in a moment, but Kyra, I wanna come to you on, on two fronts. There are two big buckets I'm interested to talk to you about. Uh, the first is privacy. Uh, the second is gonna be all things sustainability. Um, but on the privacy side first, you know, when, when most of us think about privacy, we think about passwords. <laughs> and if we're honest, uh, we're generally not very good at it. <laughs> there was a, a NordPass survey recently that still showed the number one choice globally for password is password, yeah. followed by password one and password two. <laughs> so we're not particularly original. So then I think about the idea that this space is getting more convoluted, Kyra, and I, I do worry. So when we talk about AI and data privacy, 
what are we talking about? So I guess I want to talk about an idea that's actually old and not particularly new. And I guess to engage the people in the room, how many of you have been involved in a data breach in the last two years? Excellent. That's lots of people. Fantastic. Me too. Um, what's Fantastic. Me too. Fantastic. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so different reframe. <laughs> Really, really um, hammering home the positive energy here. Um, what's interesting about data is that we've thought really long and hard about data privacy for a really long time. How do we keep people safe when we do statistical research? Nothing to do with machine learning and AI. One of the tools we might use is to de-identify data. So you can have all of my details on the internet, but you don't know they're mine and that's okay. What's interesting is if I grab a bunch of de-identified data, and I put it into an algorithm, whether that's just a bunch of statistics or whether that's a really complex deep learning model or a large language model. Um, the idea is that you're training these models to predict something or to give you an output or to generate an image or to spit something out at the end. There's this idea in statistics um, called differential privacy. And it's this idea that even if you de-identify data, um, you, and even if you scatter things and mix things up, if you build an algorithm to spit something out at the end, sometimes you can go back and build a whole profile of data based on that output. Um, so I so give you can kind of reverse engineer it. Yeah? Right. So okay. I give you my name, my date of birth, my height, my address, my income, all of those lovely things that are probably already on the internet. Um, I feed them through a model. I think I'm pretty safe because all of that data is being spat out into one single answer. You're not getting my date of birth at the end. Um, differential privacy is this idea that if you take me out of the data set, the results don't change a great deal um, because I'm just one point in the data set. If you can take my point out of the data set and it drastically changes the outputs, well, suddenly there's this open door for reverse engineering and finding out more information about me. Mm. Maybe I'm the only person who lives in my postcode, who has my chronic condition, who has my cultural heritage. And because of that, the model always spits out that women in my postcode with my cultural heritage have these chronic conditions. Oh, suddenly I don't feel very safe and de-identified anymore, do I? Particularly mm. not when so much of my data is available online. Um, what's extra challenging about this is a lot of models are being trained on data that people have not consented to having these models trained on. Um, art generation models, many of them have been trained on artist images where artists have got no idea. Um, that's one example, but with all of my awesome Optus data out on the internet, there's nothing really stopping people using that. Mm. Um, I can't really tell them to not do it. But, um, and so it's a, it's a really major concern that we've got all of these controls in place for data privacy and we have all of these really smart ideas from statistics that are really, really old and really mathematically provable. Differential privacy is something you can prove as being present or not present. And we're not utilising them for these AI models. Um, the amount of knowledge you need to get going with AI, to be programming something, to get it running on a really big computer, um, you've got to understand a bunch of statistics for maths. Um, it, it's quite large and often what's missed in that process is some of those really old pieces of knowledge about data privacy, for example. Um, and the field just hasn't quite caught up with that. Speaking of ethics, a lot of ethics departments, AI ethics departments are actually being cut from funding. Mm. Um, so the people who would usually be in the room going, oh, there's a thing you could do to make that better, are, um, are not doing those jobs anymore, which is frustrating. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, my, my brain immediately starts thinking about what that means for marginalised communities and, and things like that in particular. Um, I, I want to touch on one more angle of your expertise and then I want to bring us to some of our audience questions. And that is this concept of sort of green computing. And I'm interested to understand a little bit more about this because many of us have probably read uh, about Bitcoin mining and just the extraordinary energy load of a lot of um, the next frontier of where we're heading. We might have heard commentary around the mining of some of the materials we're going to need to create batteries and things like that to support it as well. Um, I read recently, MIT Technology Review reported that training just one AI model, so we're talking about you know, countless, countless AI models in this conversation, can emit more than 620,000 uh, pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is nearly five times the lifetime emissions of an average American car, just one model. Um, so can you talk to us about green computing? What, what do we mean and why should we be, we be conscious of that aspect of the conversation? 
So, so I work in high performance computing. It's, it's my job to help people use big computers. And theoretically, it's my job to help them use them efficiently. The thing's turned on anyway. How do I get them to make the most of the hardware so we're not wasting energy when we're doing research and learning, whether that's with AI or other things? Silly question. Big computer, what do we mean? Big computer. It's lots of small computers that can talk to each other and make friends. So if you can <laughs> break your program down into small parts um, and you can share them across hundreds of computers, you can make your stuff go faster because you're not doing it all in a row. You're spreading it out and you're using lots and lots of small computers. Um, machine learning is really interesting because like Bitcoin mining, um, many models really benefit from training on GPUs or graphical processing units. Um, there's a bunch of mathematics behind that. Happy to talk to you about that at some <laughs> point. We'll take that one offline. We'll take that one <laughs> offline. Um, but th 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 uh, most models benefit, if you're clever and you know what you're doing, by adding more computing power to them. They'll train faster. You can process more data. Usually more data means better model. And that means more energy, I'm assuming. And that means more energy. Um, and so I read something in a paper recently where they trained on... 900 GPUs, which is, um, I have one in my house, okay, um, 900 of these things. And one of their motivations for wanting to train their model on 900 GPUs was they would train it once, release the result, and it would never need to be trained again. I immediately found researchers who wanted to retrain it with their own special data. It doesn't work like that. Um, and so this is something that's not necessarily being thought of in every paper. This paper actually thought about green computing um, and how we reduce emissions and how what they were doing would hopefully contribute to less retraining of models and less computational power going down the drain. Um, but that's not something you see in every mm. AI research paper. It's not something the average person fiddling with AI in their free time is thinking but about. But I also think, importantly, it's not something you hear talked about in a lot of the climate conversation we're talking about around, you know, how does when we think about the future of economies and we think about the industries that we are developing expertise in and funding to support, it, it's not necessarily part of that conversation either. No, and I don't know that uh, the average person that you meet on the street is aware that training a machine learning model is such a carbon intensive activity. Mm. Um, me at home playing on my single GPU that I was using anyway, okay, my impact is more or less the same as what it would have been as if I was playing a video game. Uh, people using high-performance computers, like what I work with every day, uh, don't necessarily see those computers in person, ever. They have no concept. Um, and it's really challenging to keep this in mind. Linda, you want to jump in, and then I've got a couple of questions I'm throwing you. Yeah, just before we jump to the questions, um, Kiowa made a really interesting point before about how we're not using the statistical methods that we already have to make these systems better, and that is an endemic problem in the tech industry that we are not using, not building on the knowledge we already have, not building on the research that we already have, not um, understanding what's gone before. There's a classic problem in tech, which is that every year or two, somebody reinvents phrenology, which is the idea that you can tell some, a lot about somebody from the shape of their skull. Every couple of years, you get a new system that says, I can tell your sexuality from your face or, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's fancy phrenology dressed up in machine learning. Um, we, we really need to learn from history when we're working on these systems. A lot of these ethical questions have been raised before. Mm. Linda, I want to come to you, uh, combo of two questions. Uh, do you see the Australian curriculum shifting to accommodate to the tech age? If so, how? Uh, and a question from Ari as well around what role educational institutions, which I've seen muse museums to be, so what role should museums like ScienceWorks play in influencing the future? So do you see the curriculum shifting? Whoa. And what role do museums have? Okay, these are big questions. They are. Um, the curriculum has already shifted and is shifting further. I think what we will end up seeing is that um, things like my field, data science education, is going to go through all of the subjects um, the, the tech is going to be a thread through all of the subjects because it has to be, because it influences every area of our world. Um, but it, you can't shift a curriculum quickly. You need a lot of input and a lot of um, work on it. So it, it'll be a slow process. Um, I think the big change that we need to make with the curriculum is to move it less about facts and known processes and more about problem solving and um, making positive change in the real world. But that's my personal um, uh, manifesto, I suppose. <laughs> um, as for museums, I think museums are a 
fabulous opportunity to grab people by the enthusiasm and um, show them the, the fun and the positive aspects and kind of grab them deep into it, raise, you know, with events like this, raising the, the concerns as well. Um, because people come to museums with um, open minds and hearts, wanting to learn, wanting to see, wanting to experience. And that's a, a fabulous opportunity to get those ideas and, and raise the concerns and get people having the conversation. Because that's the big issue with, with all of these technologies is that as a society, we're not really involved in the conversation. We're not steering them mm -hmm. in a way that benefits all of us. And museums can help shift that, I think. Now, Mujan, I know you've been having some challenges with audio. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear us A-OK -okay now. Hopefully you've got us. Hey, excellent. We love to see that. Uh, I want to come to you. A lot of people are asking questions around regulation. How do you think about regulating this technology? What's the way to go about it? So open question, how should we be thinking about regulation of AI? And would you draw the audience's attention to anywhere in the world that you think is starting to grapple with this well? Who, who's, who's asking the right questions? Yeah, so it's, it's a very huge topic, the regulations. And, you know, we need to have regulations. I believe we need to have it. Uh, the issue with AI is AI is just so fast in terms of development. Uh, and, you know, if you look at how regulations are made, for example, in, in Europe, uh, European um, Commission, they, you know, they work on um, uncertain uh, issues, they turn it into, you know, a recommendations, and then they become low, and, you know, you finally need to adopt it. Uh, what happened, for example, with GDPR, and now we have the AI Act coming. Um, there are so many co conversations also around the A AI Act that how efficient it can be. So there are, you know, very much pros and cons about that. But the, the fact that we need regulations is, is true. The problem of AI is that it's so fast that the moment you actually pass the law, it has spent, we have spent so much time that there's so much new topics that we need to put them inside, you know, and, um, and turn it into law. So I do believe that their current structure of uh, policy and uh, policy making and regulations for for the world is not adapted to AI, is mm. not adapted to this world. So we need to really do it differently. Um, what I think that that could be helpful, and that is, you know, some of the projects that um, uh, like very not out coming from regulation regulatory um, uh, institutions, but more from the public coming up is mm -hmm. that this, uh, um, let's say, uh, decentralized autonomous communities and organizations that they could collaborate together on creating the ethics around AI. And maybe the government can use these to turn them into uh, laws and using using already the people, communities, researchers, all the stakeholders that there are um, working with AI, the technology, they're testing them, and normal humans who are actually receiving just the applications, they have not been involved in the production of the technologies, they need to feed these, um, these uh, regulations before they turn into regulations. Mm. So I do believe that, um, I mean, if I put myself in the place of the, uh, you know, regulatory uh, institutions and governments, uh, I, I do believe it's a hard position oh, yeah. because I know they they have a good will and they would really want to make it work, but the whole structure needs to be adopted in a different way. Maybe one regulation can be um, can be put a pause on AI. This is actually the very recent you know conversations you hear more and more from the um, the slow AI movement. The the movement that has been launched after actually very recently after the chat GPT um, sort of uh, being very hype uh, and seeing that how fast uh, this technology is advancing. Uh, I do believe that, you know, that can also have its um, problems if you want to pass such, you know, regulations. It is definitely not something we will see for sure. The big uh, tech giants and uh, the, uh, the companies are working on these technologies. They mm. have enough power and resources um, not, to, not to do that. And even countries, 
among them, uh, between, you know, countries, you have the uh, AI battle. So uh, you have, you know, China and US and Russia, and, and so you have Europe. So it's very uh, difficult to to make this, um, this even like pause happening. So Absolutely. I think the solution would be really coming from the whole different uh, communities and, um, and institutions and governments and industry together to collaborate on that. I think it's a great point too that it, this is a, a threat, a challenge, maybe, maybe to take the language down a notch, but certainly to the very nature of policy making in our institutions, that the need to think differently about how we design, how we can not just catch up with the rolling ball but keep pace with it is uh, arguably one of the greatest challenges we've faced from an institutional design standpoint. And in, in fairness to a lot of our leaders navigating this, they're trying to learn just as quickly as we all are uh, to understand it enough to think about how they shape and design. Go for it, Linda. I liked uh, Mujan's point before that um, every new technology then turns out to have harms, to have ethical issues. Mm. It would be nice if we could short circuit some of that. We're already seeing mm. marginalised and vulnerable communities suffering at the hands of AI. It would be nice if we could ramp up that conversation and actually get people asking those questions, going, is this safe? Who does it harm? Mm. How can we make it better? So I want to come to a question from who I'm going to guess is our youngest viewer today, though feel free to jump in questions and let me know otherwise. Uh, Lela, uh, who's 10 years old, has asked, how will AI affect my life? What I would like to invite each of our panellists to do is to give Lela a reason for hope and optimism. So what is something you would draw... Uh, exactly. We've been a little bit focused on the challenges and it can be a little bit overwhelming at times, but there is truly transformative capability that is being unleashed. There are points of light, there are opportunities galore. So I would love to have uh, a reason for hope or optimism for our youngest listener uh, today. So Kaiwa, I might come to you first. What's, what's something you would draw uh, Lila's attention to? There's lots of tricky problems that I think AI can help us do much faster and much more easily, which means our brains will have a lot more room left over at the end of every day to think of new exciting things. Um, something I played with last week that Meta Facebook released is this awesome little AI model where you can give it a picture you've drawn. So I make a lot of art in my free time and it will animate it for you. So you... <laughs> The animals you give it a, in speaking of animation, animals. Give it a picture of a seagull um, <laughs> and it will have it run around. It will have it open its beak. It will have it do somersaults and really cool things. And that's really cool because if I'm at work and I'm designing a PowerPoint presentation or I'm building a website and I want moving pictures on it, um, I now don't have to learn animation from scratch. I now don't have to learn how to log into all of these things and do all of this technology myself because my presentation isn't about animation it's about seagulls because apparently I'm a seagull scientist now um, and so now I get the benefit of being able to solve really tricky problems with really easy interfaces um, I can press buttons and make things go faster I can press buttons and write a report for work which means instead of writing a report about what I did I can keep doing more of whatever it is that I'm doing so there's lots of good stuff that I think AI is going to enable us to do in terms of freeing up brain power to do other interesting stuff. So we'll finally free ourselves from having to animate PowerPoints. That is very exciting. Uh, I don't know if our youngest listener can quite appreciate how profound that is. <laughs> but everyone in the room uh, who's, who's a little bit older can. Uh, Linda, I want to come to you. What's, what's a point of light for you? Um, I think one of the amazing things that AI is going to be able to do is really personalise stuff for us. So it will be able to identify things like when our health has taken a bit of a dip and maybe find out, uh, figure out what the issue is before it gets, uh, before it becomes a real problem. Or it'll be able to find you the information you want on some topic that you're really interested in and present it to you in a way that's really personalised for you. So some people like to watch videos. I personally hate watching videos. I need to read stuff. So for me, it would present it to me as words. For video lovers, it would present it as videos. You know, it, just that uh, ability to really tailor information to you and present it in the best way. Um, I think that's that's coming. We are a long way from that now, just to be clear. <laughs> um, but I think that is coming. 
You've also told me there's some pretty exciting stuff happening in healthcare. Do you want to speak about that? Yeah, so um, some of the things, and, and I think it's important to call it machine learning, not artificial intelligence, because it's not intelligent. But we have can some... You, can you hold on? Can you double stay there for a moment? Yep. Double click. AI versus machine learning. Let's just make sure we're using terms that everyone understands. Can you explain the difference? Yep. So artificial intelligence suggests that the system is intelligent. Um, that there are a lot of systems labelled AI that are not intelligent. In fact, there are no intelligent systems. Um, but machine learning, I think, is more accurate because the machine is learning stuff, not necessarily the stuff we want it to learn, but it is learning stuff. Um, and so it's a little less uh, magical. You know, it's a little. Le it gives us less um, less of a false impression of how clever these systems are. Um, machine learning systems are incredibly good at doing incredibly specific things, right? So um, you can teach a machine learning system to identify, and this is done, um, skin cancers, and, and identify them with accuracy under certain conditions, in certain ways. You know, there's very, very specific. Uh, a system that can identify skin cancers will not be able to identify lung cancer, and it will not be able to identify other issues with your skin. Um, it's only for identifying skin cancer. So you can see there a little bit of the difference between machine learning and the idea of intelligence. Yeah. If it were intelligent, it would be able to see other things and extrapolate and learn other things. These systems can't, they can do one thing really well. And there are some very powerful systems out there that are, that are doing diagnostic things that are figuring out um, whether a particular scan has cancers in it or whether particular cells are cancerous or precancerous. That kind of stuff has real power, but it has to be in concert with expert um, doctors. I hope our online listeners can hear the uh, wildlife interaction we're having in the room live as well. Uh, Mujan, I want to come to you. What gets you excited about the future and what AI makes possible? Uh, I think what it excites me is if we can, uh, we can use AI to save biodiversity, to heal the planet, to find ways that we can um, understand where we are harming actually the planet and stop it. For example, there are some companies working on uh, scanning um, the, sat uh, the, the earth, you know, with, with satellite imagery. They understand where is the most efficient spot on earth to plant trees because, you know, it's not just like you plant one tree anywhere in the world, it has the same effect. You actually, uh, it depends on many, many things. It's the, the type of the tree and the area that you look, is located. So um, if, if we can know better how we use our resources more efficiently uh, to basically um, make sure that all our efforts are going to uh, in the right direction, that is something I think is tremendous um, with all the climate change that we have, especially for our young generation. These are the applications we want to work on to be able to maximize our efforts. For example, there are um, now nowadays like drone imagery that they can take um, pictures of deep sea in, in oceans and find where the plastics are there. Because if you know, 80% of the plastics on land uh, end up in the sea, in, in oceans in the world. So there are um, a machine learning basically applications. Now they can know where are those plastics so we can actually go and uh, take them out of the sea. So these are the applications I'm very excited about and I think they are absolutely needed and we can do so much just you know, by using uh, our focus on, on these parts. Awesome. Now, we've got some questions coming through. Uh, I want to grab a couple of them. Uh, I noticed in your LinkedIn bio, you talk about the fact that you like to draw cat comics. So I feel like I'm going to come to you on this, Kiowa, uh, with regards to what impact AI is going to have on the world of art and design. Any thoughts on that front? This one hurts my head because I'm an artist and I haven't formed my opinion on this yet. I bet. It's quite conflicting. I, I've heard a lot of artists you know, wrestle with this tension. So what's interesting for me as an artist is when I sit down to make an artwork, often I'm trying to look for reference pictures. I would like a picture of somebody doing the washing and I really want to be viewing them from this angle and oh, it would be really good if the light was over here 
and it would also be really you have all of these variables in your head about the thing you would like to create and you know generating something stylistic whether that's a cat on a computer um, or whether that's a realistic piece of art is always made a lot more easy when you've got models and references like this. So when I see AI generated art, I go, awesome, I'm gonna tell it to generate my reference images and then I'm gonna do what I do as an artist to make that more interesting or more meaningful or just nice to look at. Sometimes that's why we make art. Um, however, I'm conflicted with the fact that there's this idea that we will never need to pay artists ever again because AI can generate pictures and that's cool computers can do a lot of things that we still pay people to do um, because we value their work and we value the humanity that people bring to their work I'm sure we could get a bunch of robots up on stage to perform theater and I'm well, certain it would be fascinating this was the controversy okay. for many Spotify <laughs> listeners this week that happened with the the Drake song in the weekend right where they actually used AI to uh, make what sounded like a song by those artists but was entirely created by machines. And we've had people submit AI generated images to photography contests mm -hmm. and then win the contest and then say, no, 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 please don't let me win. That's that's not actually photography, that's, that's AI generated. And so we've got this real conflict here and a broader conflict, I think, as a society about automation and what that means for people's wages and living conditions and whether or not, as Mujan was saying, these things actually make society better as a whole. Is the world better if we outsource all of our art to machines? Don't think so. Uh, is the world better if we outsource all of our creative endeavours to machines as artificial intelligence perhaps becomes intelligent? Don't think so. <laughs> um, grappling with that's really hard. I'd mm. be interested in hearing what other people think about this because I haven't made my mind up. I don't know if anyone else wants to add in, but the other thing I'm very keen to talk about, given it is International Day of Women and Girls in ICT, is the role that women and non-binary people have in shaping this industry. Uh, and we know right now it, it lacks the diversity it needs to. There's a question from one of our listeners who's asked about the, the current biases that exist. Uh, I guess I want to frame it more in the what can be done than it is talking about the current state of the problem. What can we do to get more women and non-binary people into the industry and helping shape it. Linda, I, I want to come to you first. So for me, that's all about education. And I love that Tanya made the point in her intro that diversity is not just about gender. Completely. Um, diversity is about cultural, linguistic, uh, neurological, uh, physical. There's a whole range of things that we need to talk about with diversity. And we tend to forget when we focus on it's very easy to measure the fact that there are not very many women and non-binary people in tech, um, but we we don't measure all the rest of the things. They're a lot more complicated to measure. Um, but when we teach kids in school that STEM is a tool they can use to solve problems in the real world and it's something that they can actually do and something that they are they can be good at and something that is worth doing, then I believe we will solve the diversity problem in tech because we will have a huge range of people wanting to come into tech who currently are going, I am not a pizza eating tech bro, therefore tech is not my thing. <laughs> Prajan, I want to come to you on this as well because you've been instrumental globally in founding a number of uh, women in, in AI events as well as a number of significant events uh, across all range of cultures and different countries. Uh, what's your take on what we can do to encourage greater diversity into shaping and making decisions in AI? Yeah, thank you so much. I actually um, want to second on what Linda said about diversity, the dimension of diversity, it goes beyond gender. Mm -hmm. um, specifically for our activities at Women in AI, we started simply uh, yeah, with the with the biggest actually discrimination against the like the half of the population, which is against women, and we wanted to um, yeah bring them on so they can build these technologies together. Um, what I think that it's necessary to do, as we mentioned it uh, you know in in our discussion, it's education is fundamental, but also funding. I think funding initiatives by women. Uh, I don't know if I'm the audience. Maybe some of you you think about creating your or your own company, building you know a, a technology, a product that uh, solves a real problem. These are all things that you know um, they need support. Uh, as a woman, we are mostly underfunded. Um, 
you know, women and minorities are very, very underfunded if they are uh, raising VC capital, if they want to launch their company. So we need support from the government. We need support from the organization who fund them to encourage them. I think, you know, awards is one of the, you know, best ways to do that. We at Women AI, we organize multiple awards for women innovators, entrepreneurs in Australia. I think you might have heard about the Women AI Awards um, in the continent. I think all these initiatives are important and connecting them together uh, with different um, institutes, with different um, other initiatives to collaborate together on them. So if you, for example, um, let's say you want to create a project that is linked to some research, why not collaborating with the research center? And if we can combine these initiatives together mm. and partner up, that is actually uh, a very uh, strong way to help um, you know, diverse talents find their way and find opportunities. But the main important thing is starts by us, mm -hmm. by ourselves, that knowing that we can do things. And I was just at the, I'm at a conference that I there was a speaker on the stage that you just need to dream and dream big and believe in yourself that there is nothing that can stop you. And you know, just um, keep your passion uh, and the way actually will appear and you will find, you know, ways to um, crack the code. <laughs> Guy was on the edge of her seat wanting to jump in, go for it. What would you like to add? I actually, I read a report recently about how we engage more women in particular into AI and computing in general. And one of the things the report said was that uh, we should be encouraging people to think of technology as a people-focused Thing. It's not about the computer, it's about what the computer can do for people. I experience this at work. I work with people and I help them do whatever it is they need me to do with their code or their computer and I make them happy and that's why I go to work. I gave a talk to some high school girls recently about um, women in computing and the history of women in computing. And one of the things I made an offhand comment about in the presentation was that I got to work with lots of people and I had multiple girls come up to me after the presentation and go, what do you do with people? I thought you worked with computers. <laughs> and they were really excited about that. Um, and I think of myself as a bit of a creative person and an artist. For a long time, I went, well, I don't really belong in science. That's kind of stupid, which is not true. Um, scientists are super creative. Of course I belong with scientists. Everybody belongs with scientists. Um, and so I think it's important to rethink that tech bro eating pizza example and think about, well, we actually need creative people in technology and we need policy-driven people in technology and we need people-focused people in technology because that opens it up to people who might not ordinarily think they have the skill sets or the right personality for the industry. I think that link's so beautiful. How do we help people with Mujan, something uh, you said earlier, which was that idea of how does it make us more human too? And, and Linda, to your point, how do we think about the full spectrum of humanity in the way that we consider that? Yeah. Uh, our time is rapidly drawing to a close, so I get the opportunity to just ask each of you for a very short answer to the following question, which is, I think sometimes it's, it's easy to come to these things and, and I hope you've, you've learned something new and been, been challenged by some of the things that our presenters have shared. Uh, but if it doesn't move beyond this room, nothing changes. And so what I'd love to ask you to offer our audience is a suggestion for something they can leave this conversation, this future forum, and go and do. Um, so what is something they can go instigate a conversation around, go proactively research, go have a go at and experiment with? Uh, just a quick uh, answer from each of you around what's one thing you'd love to invite or encourage our audience to go do after listening to this chat? We'll go, Kiwi, your, your, your way onwards. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. I have half an hour in my calendar booked out every week to Google AI in the news tab of Google and just read stuff that's happening. And then sometimes I think it's boring and I'm not interested and sometimes I find something really fascinating and I grab onto it and I ask myself lots of questions like, how did they do that and why did they do that and where did the funding for that come from and what can I learn about this model and is there a YouTube video about how this worked? And actually setting aside time mm -hmm. to do little snippets of learning because I'm not going to read deep research papers and code every model I ever hear about, it's not going to happen. But actually spending just five minutes to half an hour once a week learning something new and thinking about the impact of the new thing has made a really big difference into how I approach AI and conversations about AI with other people. I've just got a more holistic view, I think. It's something you could do if you've got five minutes every week, which many of us do not. I love that discipline of create some learning time each week and just put that time aside to be curious. 
Linda, what would you add? I would, um, just to kind of follow on with that theme, go play with the technology if you haven't already, but play with it with your critical thinking faculties dialed right up. <laughs> you know, um, think about the answers it's giving you, go do your own research, and uh, that's, a, that's a loaded term now, but actually do <laughs> research. You know, go, go look at, and see whether those answers are, are correct and yep. think about um, think about what it's making you think and what it's making you feel and ask yourself how you feel about that. I love that. Be a critical consumer. Mujan, what would you bring us home with? Yeah, I agree with the, both uh, suggestions. I think what I would suggest is to do on a daily basis or if you can on a weekly basis at least something you feel a little bit uncomfortable and see if you can for example in the same line of learning something new i know that the first time i was going to try chat gpt i was like oh it's another you know dummy chatbot or whatever and and then i was like oh, okay i should actually sign up and you know learning um doing something that you were you have a resistance is actually interesting to see why why you're resisting and then having that critical mindset that Linda mentioned that's essential so uh, what I do also myself is to ha listen to podcasts I have like this very short like 10 to 12 minutes uh, episodes on different podcast um, platforms that uh, I sign up and they just give me like a, either an overview of what's happening in the AI industry in the tech or they uh, explain me a very um, specific topic uh, in, the, in AI. Uh, it can be AI or it can be tech, whatever you, you're more interested in. But listen to them and, yeah, try to try them uh, now and then and feel like how you feel about it too. I love that. Not only just listen, but be curious about your own response and, and about resistance in particular if you find that you're meeting new topics with the, that way of engaging. The seagulls are coming for us here, everyone. <laughs> so I better wrap up our conversation uh, because they're getting hungry. It's clearly dinner time. Uh, so uh, well, firstly, can you join me in giving a thunderous virtual applause and physical applause for our fabulous panellists. Uh, thank you, Kiowa. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Mujan. What a fabulous and wide-ranging conversation we've had the benefit of enjoying. Thank you for asking so many wonderful questions. I apologise we couldn't get to all of them. There were so many flooding in, which is fantastic. Uh, and I hope we picked on topics that you came interested in. And it's certainly the start of a much bigger conversation. That goes without saying. Um, connect back to Museums Victoria and Science is a Superpower. Uh, we will have a little bit of a trailer at the end of this talk. Um, there's a hashtag keep sciencing that you can follow and engage with on social media as well to stay across everything that's happening there. And uh, Tanya mentioned at the start where there's some workshops coming soon. Science is a Superpower workshop series is beginning in May during Melbourne Design Week uh, for age 10 to 12 uh, young women. So if you've got anyone in your world that could benefit from the opportunity to reframe their relationship to STEM and ICT and to get excited about the future that it could have for them, by all means, uh, encourage them to come along there. There is a survey that will be emailed out and you can go in the running to win a $50 museum store voucher. So if you could take a minute to answer those couple of quick questions, you could well uh, win the opportunity to get some fabulous museum merch. Um, and finally, we've got some forum events coming up soon. There's some events as part of Melbourne Design Week. So there's Design Beyond Earth, which is on Saturday the 20th of May here at ScienceWorks. And then there's Design for Future Health, Human Health, which is on Monday the 22nd of May at the Melbourne Museum. So thank you so much, one and all, for joining this fabulous conversation. Thank you once again to our panellists and good evening. Hello and welcome to the Science is a Superpower series. In this show, we're gonna unpack the science behind our superpowers and get hyped about our hypotheses. We're also gonna meet some fantastic women who are gonna help us develop the skills to survive using STEM.